Next year's World Cup in Qatar will mark 20 years since the last time it was won by a team from South America, when Ronaldo inspired Brazil to win it for a fifth time. Since then, Europe, and specifically Western Europe, has dominated. The only two teams from outside Western Europe to make the top three in the last four events have been Croatia in 2018, which is so close as to almost count given it borders Italy, and Argentina in 2014, which needed an otherworldly tournament from Lionel Messi. Though football is becoming ever more global, the number of countries that can actually win its flagship event is shrinking. And we see a similar effect in the Champions League, where the presence of a team from outside the top leagues in the latter stages is rare, and a Central or Eastern European team in the semi-finals would be truly shocking. Last happening over 20 years ago. How did that come about? Why does Western Europe dominate football? The list of genuine contenders in Qatar is led by reigning champion France, the winners of the previous two World Cups, Germany and Spain, and the two Euro 2020 finalists, Italy and England. Not so coincidentally, those are also the countries which host the world's top five domestic leagues. But also unsurprisingly, those five take positions two through six on Europe's most populous nations list. Obviously, having more people increases the number of very good players within a country, along with the chance of having a true world-beater among them. But of course, population isn't the only factor that influences performance. Otherwise, China, India and the US would all be football powerhouses. And though other sports are competing for interest there, Europe's number one country by population, Russia, and other nations with huge populations like Nigeria, Mexico, Turkey, Iran, and Colombia count football as their most popular sport. And with so many people, they can produce some world-class talents, but are never among the contenders. One huge reason is geographical and historic. Western Europe's temperate climate creates fertile ground, which allows huge numbers of people to live in close proximity, but also led to many different cultures and then countries developing over a number of centuries. This then led to an exchange of information and, as it relates to football, tactics and playing styles, with Dutch total football in the 1970s a forerunner to modern tiki-taka in Spain, with Pep Guardiola then spreading that philosophy to Germany with Bayern Munich and England with Manchester City. This connectivity has always been key. England left FIFA in 1928 and didn't enter the first few World Cups, and that withdrawal stunted its development. In 1953, England lost 6-3 at home and then 7-1 away to Hungary's mighty Magyars, at a time when Central Europe was far better connected than the West, through the relations of nations within the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. But as Eastern European nations became more insular as the Cold War went on, the West clawed back its advantage in connectivity, along with better living conditions luring talented footballers and coaches. Now, as the world has shrunk with communication and, until lately, travel becoming easier, the exchange of ideas should also be easier, allowing the rest of the world to catch up. But these gains are lost, and then some. Advances in communication technology have also made top leagues more accessible, with the increase in streaming deals and sponsorship creating more money flowing in. Football has long been big business, but it gets bigger every year. What this leads to are the richer, more successful clubs being able to sign the best talent. Not just at senior level, where the effect is seen with the same teams dominating the Champions League and their own domestic competitions, but also at junior levels. The world's top clubs have developed state-of-the-art academies to nurture the next generation, and more of those young prospects are being lured from abroad at a young age. Even where rules exist to prevent poaching youngsters from overseas, they are still signed earlier, like Real Madrid signing Vinicius Jr. from Flamingo for 45 million euros. Top South American players often leave for Europe before they've had a chance to make an impact on their own continents. 
Similarly, Western European countries have developed national structures to provide a platform for grooming local talent. Take the French National Institute at Clairefontaine, which counts 1998 World Cup winner Thierry Henry, along with 2018 World Cup winners Kylian Mbappe, Olivier Giroud, and Blaise Matuidi among its graduates. If you start between the age of 12 and 15, without uprooting the player, without taking him off his family, living in his environment, playing with his teammates, his usual teammates in his club. But if we do one training a day for the best, then we'll get better players in the development years of 15 to uh, 20, and a better football player afterwards. Other countries have similar models such as England starting to see the benefits of its National Football Centre at St George's Park, which opened in 2012. So why don't other countries have academies as good as those in Western Europe? As always, follow the money. Not only do the national associations reap the benefits of their clubs and nations doing well in major competitions, but even when funds are made available to improve grassroots football in developing footballing nations, Far too often, we see that money not actually going to the right places. Look at the 20 biggest countries that count football as their most popular sport and check which have the highest corruption among that group. And you'll see which countries are relatively disappointing for the number of players they can boast. Among the least corrupt, four of them are from those big five nations. And Spain would join that group if we made it the top 22. In the end, for a country to succeed, it needs to have a huge population, be well connected, be relatively fair and democratic, and develop the youth. And then after all that, allow capitalism to do its worst, with the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. So in a sense, the race has already been run and won. It means that those breaking up the Western European domination are outliers and save for a seismic shift, not just in football, but in the global economy, it's not changing anytime soon. But that doesn't mean the games aren't worth watching. There's still magic in an upset. And when the heavy hitters meet, there should be a pretty decent game of football. But what do you think? Is there hope for the rest of the world in Qatar? Let us know below. We've also got more on football's best academies here. And you can subscribe for more unbeaten football videos.